they are all. Okay. I will present George Legradi, next speaker. George Legradi is a distinguished professor in the interdisciplinarity arts, engineering, media arts, and technology program at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he is, direct, is the director of the Experimental Visualization Lab at the same university. George Legradi is not only a wide known researcher, but also an internationally exhibited digital media, art, media artist with projects realized at the intersections of photography, interactive installations, data, and computationally generated visualizations, cultural analysis, and the digital humanities. He contributed to the digital media arts field since the mid-1980s through a critical investigation of the impact of computation and creative coding in photographic visualization. He's also an expert in semiotics, information theory, data visualization, natural language processing, and cultural studies. His artistic practice and research have been supported by various agencies in the arts and sciences, including the National Science Foundation, um, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Canada Council for the Arts, and others. His artworks are included in the collections of the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, San Francisco Museum of Art, Smithsonian Institution, Vasarely Museum, and many others. We really thank him for joining us in Liège, we are really delighted to listen to his talk entitled Intersections of Visual Semiotics and Computational Design, Conceptual and Aesthetic Explorations with Generative Artificial Intelligence Image Synthesis. Thanks, thank you. George. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the organizers to, to invite me. Uh, uh, it's uh, my first time in Liège, and so interesting to be here. The uh, also, this gives me the opportunity to uh, report um, the works that we've been doing in my lab the last six months. Uh, I will only present my own work, uh, artistic work. And so, and there's going to be some other presentations in the, today and tomorrow, I think, of uh, focused on image synthesis. And so, uh, in the middle of uh, August, um, I started to design a, a course, and in the fall, we've been focused on image synthesis. So I teach in a program that is um, mostly computer science based. So, so the students produce projects, but it's a computer science. So they have the computational background. Um, and of course, um, I'm, I'm an artist and I lead the, the group. So we, we have a kind of hybrid, hybrid focus. So what I'm reporting on today is my work with uh, Mid Journey version three. And one of the advantages that I have given the long time that I've been working in the field is that I experienced the transition from analog photography to, to digital photography. So that my talk's gonna begin with that. This is a, an, a capture of upper left. It's a capture of a sequence of images produced in mid journey. And it just kind of shows you what's it, what's what's in the record so the upper left is the most recent and i think i must have produced maybe 8000 10000 images in the last um um yeah six four months so for i'm pretty sure some of you know how it works uh, i just want to go over some of the basics you type in a phrase it, it produces an image. In my case, the phrase is imaginary workspaces, electrostatic. And I get four images and out of these four images, I either can choose, U means um, 
take one image and make a larger version of it, or V means make four variations of it. So the kind of the subtext of the presentation is what are the control mechanisms? Where does the artist participate in the aesthetic development of this? And here is another screenshot of some of the settings, which tells you which version I'm using, what's the quality, to what degree do I want the uh, mid journey to affect the style? And uh, part of the philosophy of, of mid journey is that it's kind of a community based. So everybody sees what everybody else is doing. Uh, this, this is fine in the exploratory phase, but then in terms of producing artistic works, then one one is confronted with the question of, you know, where does intellectual property go? And so I've kind of set it to private mode, which means only I can see what's going on. And then finally, here's an example of one image that was brought up and then you have some further choices. So going back nearly 50 years, uh, this is my graduate work at the San Francisco Art Institute in 1975 and the, the goal at the time was to create a series of photographs where you point the camera at the world and uh, to, to explore to what degree one can use the properties of, of the optical mechanical system. So uh, in those days one would walk around in the world and try to make compositions. And the minute you click the, the camera, that was the end of the, the creative process. Of course, there was another creative process, which was the development part. But um, yeah, so this is my graduate work at the San Francisco Art Institute. And I try to explore a little bit what were the, the set of rules by which I, um, you know, will go about to create create an image, and so these are some of the some of the approaches. So basically, um, the the photographic approach was not to represent the world. It wasn't about taking a photograph of the world, but to use to use that process by which to explore what are the uh, syntax and the semantics of how one creates an image. And in the middle of my graduate school, uh, at one point I went to a site and instead of photographing the site itself, I collected some of the objects that I found there and I brought them back into the studio and then I created this work and what it is, it's a uh, systematic organization with the goal of trying to reach coherence and aesthetic uh, resolution. I was 25 years old. I had no clue about semiotics or about uh, systems of organization. And it took me until this summer to find a good reference that would explain what I did. And it's this book by uh, Stanislaus de Hange. Some of you may be familiar with this book. And uh, in the book itself, what it talks about is how, how children learn. Uh, I came across this particular diagram, which is given a set of objects, how do you go about organizing them? Eventually, a couple, of, a couple of years later, I started to leave, leave the street and move into the studio and construct images in the studio itself. And to kind of explore to what degree, uh, when you have a caption, to what degree that caption can re reinforce or um, play or contradict whatever was in that particular uh, image. 
And this came about from reading books on, on psychology and some other uh, reference. The photograph gives you an image that looks realistic, but in fact is fictional to a great degree. Um, it's a capture in time and space. From there, I went towards continuing with the staging of images, but trying to set up uh, storyboards as a way to create a narrative. Um, allowing the visual elements somehow work with each other. And in 1981, I was very fortunate. I, I quit my professor job in Canada and I moved down, returned to California. And this is San Diego. I met a painter uh, named Harold Cohen, who today is considered one of the fathers of artificial intelligence. Uh, Harold was writing a program that would paint like him. So uh, the idea was, could we transfer his, his um, uh, implicit methods of, of creating an image and translate that into language? And once you could translate it into language, then you could turn it into computer code, and then the, the computer could do that work. So I learned computing in his studio. He, he gave me complete access to the studio. Uh, you know, these large, large uh, computers with the tape. And it was only six years later that I could begin to come across a software that would allow me to produce uh, images that would have the resolution of photographs. So these are 512 pixels by 480 pixels. It was, there's many things in the image um, I'm using. I'm mostly uh, looking at Claude Shannon's information theory and writing code that kind of produces some of, some of the textures. The, the frames were done in a 3D software using ray tracing. And so this is just to give you an idea of, of uh, the effort that was going into producing an image. Um, but there were a lot of steps in the construction of an image like this, which um, then leads to a, another approach called generative art. And generative art refers to any art practice where the artist uses a system such as a set of natural language rules, a computer program, or other procedural invention, which is set into motion with some degree of autonomy. And so basically, in a situation like this, you have the artist writing computer code and trying to see what the computer code can do. And then one kind of sees results, and one then goes back and continues to fine tune, fine -tune that uh, until you, you reach a situation that is acceptable to, to your work. So this is an example I did uh, maybe three years ago. These are, it's, it's a software that, that um, creates a virtual 3D space into which I throw a series of images. They could be anything. In this case, they're mostly photographs. And the software organizes them in that space. And then I go into the space and I try to uh, come up and create a framed composition that kind of suits my aesthetic interests. So it's the same thing as going out into the world and taking photographs, except now I'm kind of going into this virtual space that I've created. OK, so this is a. Kind of overview of some of the uh, steps with generative artificial intelligence, text to image synthesis. So basically, all of the activity that I just described in terms of how one creates as a practitioner or work is kind of taken away because all we have now is very limited controls. All we can do is 
type in a text and select an image. Uh, so in other words, initiate the process and at the end do the uh, curating. So it's an opaque process. That's one of the challenges. You know, how, how does an artist then work with this in, in a way that can result in some sense of collaboration? Um, now, 30 years ago, I created a, a work that's pretty similar in some ways, or the idea was to, in the, at the museum installation, you come to the computer, you type in a text, and it produces an abstract image. So this was presented at the Porto Museum in, in Winter Tour, Switzerland, and some other places in the US. So I was very much uh, interested in the question of to what degree can a text create an image? And of course, I was very limited by the te technology of the time. So in the end, we ended up using a um, what's called a um, midpoint, two-dimensional midpoint fractal synthesis algorithm. So here you can kind of see some of the some of the results, and at the end of the image making process, um, the software will bring up other phrases that people have contributed to the to the installation during the length of the exhibition. And my reference was Alfred Stieglitz, photographer from 1927-1930, who took a series of photographs of clouds. And they are considered to be the first abstract photographs. OK, jumping now from 1992 to uh, 2020, uh, since 2017, we've been looking at all of the various algorithms by which one could process images. And uh, Xavier Snellgrove, who's a researcher at the University of Toronto came up with this particular variation. He calls it neural texture synthesis, and it's based on Gaddis's style transfer, which you may be familiar with, where you have a style of, you use the style of Van Gogh or Cezanne to kind of stylize another image. So in this case, I used eight of my um, photographs from my graduate um, portfolio, as I pointed, as I showed you before, and the the two images on the left shows you the process. Uh, the first one after about ten iterations, and the one on the right after about one hundred fifty iterations. Okay, so this brings us to the series, and I'm going to go through this relatively fast. Oh, uh, the <laughs> Can you turn up the volume, please? It's, uh, it's doing it. So the, this is from the series called um, The Alchemist Study and also Imaginary Workspaces. And it'll just kind of give you some examples of the process of how, how the software works and the question of to what degree can can the artist have some control? Now there's, what's interesting here is that certain things stay the same and other things change. And of course, these are selections from hundreds and hundreds, most of which uh, do not fit, let's say, the aesthetic intent. This is from the series Imaginary Workspaces. Uh, this morning I woke up at the, the uh, hotel and went down for breakfast. And I don't, I don't know if anybody's noticed that, but if you kind of go to the back, uh, it looks exactly like the scene. <laughs> I was surprised. So the question is, you know, 
where do these images come from? So they're obviously constructed from billions of images. And, and as the artist, uh, what are my control abilities? So curate, select. How, how does the software go from what we just saw to something like this? It's kind of the question that my research group is trying to figure out. So we're seeing industrial spaces, kitchens, sci-fi worlds, dystopian soup kitchens. But then uh, with some slight modification, then it goes something like this. And I've been trying to push the software to go in a direction that it is not intended to go, which is abstract painting of a certain kind. And you can notice here, so these are all from billions of photographs. So you can kind of notice that we're seeing these abstract shapes, but they come out of like a photographic uh, resource. This one kind of closely is connected, I think, to the first one we saw there. Uh, this next one kind of gives you an idea of variation, similarity, and difference. So the question is, what keeps the similarity? What makes the difference? And what kind of control can one have? And this chart kind of, the blue is the beginning. The yellow is the processing, which we don't have any control over. And then the green is the results. So, um, so there's a site called have I not been trained.com. And it kind of gives you an idea of, of um, a very small sample of the billions of images it uses. So I typed in imaginary workspace and I get this. Searching 5.8 billion images. And the idea of have I not been trained is to see to what degree any of your personal pictures are in the database. So people have been finding uh, photographs of them in medical situations. This one here, I typed in complex nature and uh, it kind of reveals a particular direction. I was expecting photographs, but instead mm -hmm. I got paintings. So, The challenges are here. Um, as a practitioner, one has control at the beginning and at the end, but not in the middle. And the question is, to what degree can we break that? To what degree can we uh, fight the bias of the, of the system? And Midjourney itself promises that it will produce aesthetically pleasing images but they're exactly the kind of images I don't want. So the challenge is how do you, how do you turn the system around by continuous uh, selection of directions that would not necessarily fit the community's interests that are participating in that journey. And my last slide, um, I was talking with my friend Philip, and the question was, so given the very limits of how one can influence the direction, what are the forces at play? And, and his email told me the following. 
the choice of image nowadays is a new form of framing the image. It may have been luck, but informed luck, connecting to all sorts of memories and impulses, imaginings, envisioning what bypasses the mid-journey style or luck. So anyway, so there we are. We've actually moved on to stable diffusion and, and dream booth. Dream booth allows for uh, both stable diffusion has is open source, so we can write the code. And so that's that's kind of currently the state of our the research at our lab. And um, the PowerPoint is going to be posted here if anybody wants to re revisit some of the images shown. Thank you very much. Thank you.